Hi there everyone, I'm Mark from Folkway Music. I hope you're all doing well today. First off, thanks very much for all the comments uh, on previous videos. Um, I do appreciate the feedback and, uh, and thanks again for the suggestions of new topics to cover. Um, I'll do my best to keep them coming. Um, I do a lot of guitar repair as well, so there's a bit of a balancing act, but I'll do what I can to keep some interesting videos um, showing up on your feeds. Um, today I have with me this guitar. Um, a lot of people were asking me to highlight this in a video. It's a 1930 Gibson L2, the Argentine Grey or Gold Sparkle variety. And, um, and it's a really interesting guitar. Um, the model's really interesting, and this particular one is very interesting as well. Um, the L2 was introduced in 1929 uh, alongside the first Calcroydon models. Um, and at a time when Gibson uh, enlarged their L body to this shape uh, from the earlier sort of Robert Johnson size guitars, like this one right over here I showed you the other day. That's a, an LO from a couple years earlier. That was the size of L-body guitars um, until late in 29 when Gibson said, okay, well, let's make them this big instead. Um, and uh, so they increased the size of the Nick Lucas and the L1. They introduced the L2 and they introduced the Calcroydon um, as well at that same time. And they were all this shape and they had X bracing and um, 12 fret necks as well. The L2 was Gibson's second fanciest guitar behind the Nick Lucas. Um, it had the gold sparkle along the edges, like you see in this one, on the rosette. And it had this finish that Gibson called the Argentine Gray uh, finish. I don't know why it's called that, um, but uh, there it is. That's what Gibson called it, and that's what we still call it. It has this green cast to the sunburst. Um, some of them are more brownish. Others are more green. Some are even more green than this one. Um, it was a relatively fancy guitar for Gibson, obviously, with the gold sparkle. It had Nick Lucas style binding. It had these engraved Throne Plate Waverleys, just like the Nick Lucas model as well. And then the, we call the Jester Peghead uh, inlay uh, in pearl. I don't know what Gibson thought that was either. I mean, it's, it's pretty amoebic and weird, but it's become very endearing to us vintage guitar people. The original nut on this guitar, you can see the shape of it. Um, the original bridge. The guitar is totally original with the exception of the saddle. It's not had a neck reset. Um, there are no cracks in the body. There's no braces that were loose um, or repaired ever. Uh, it really it only has this one flaw, which is this little teeny tiny crack through the end pin. Um, so it makes a really great study case uh, for what an early L2 is all about. This one is from factory order number 9573, for those of you keeping track of such things. And uh, the first ones were from the late uh, from the high 9400s. Um, the very first L2s, it should be said, didn't look like this. Um, they had other strange features, different sunbursts, didn't have the gold sparkle. Um, many of them had banjo tuners uh, and banjo style volute or 70s Gibson style volutes on the back of the headstock. They look different. Um, but uh, by late in 29, they got to this, this look. And, uh, and it stuck around for a whole whopping year and a half or so. Um, by 1931, sometime in 31, the L2 had changed again to the rosewood back and sides version with a natural top and arch top style bridge and trapeze tailpiece and an elevated pickguard. It's a strange hybrid between a flat top and an arch top guitar. Um, and they, they built that guitar for, again, not very long, maybe a year, and, uh, and then dropped that. Um, in the tra transitions between all these different kinds of L2s, there are weirdo batches of instruments. There's a batch of L2s that are a 14 fret Brazilian rosewood natural top. Essentially imagine a 14 fret Brazilian rosewood um, L00. Uh, those exist. Um, there are, wow, there's every permutation and combination you can think of. Anyways, the, what's interesting about this guitar, let's go back to these gold sparkles. The L2, uh, when it first came out, and the Kelcroydons when they first came out in, in early 1930, were built, uh, let's just say, exceptionally, exceptionally lightly. Um, meaning, yes, they're kind of weightless. This guitar weighs in at under three pounds, um, which is heavier than a lot of Kelcroydons. The difference being that the neck on this guitar has a real thickness to it and a truss rod. And the metal truss rod, of course, is gonna add some weight. Um, the Kelcroydons, by comparison, here's one here, incidentally. Here's a Kelcroydon, this is a, 
I can't even read this factory order number. Um, in any case, it has a much skinnier neck and a skinny fingerboard. You can see how thin that fingerboard is. A lot of Kelkoridans featured this skinny fingerboard, um, at least later in their, in their build. The very early ones usually had the thicker fingerboard. Um, but that skinny fingerboard and no truss rod often give the Kelkoridans their problematic neck problem syndrome, um, where they have way too much relief. And there's um, not an easy way to fix that, uh, short of taking the fingerboard off, installing neck reinforcement, and gluing this fingerboard or a replacement full thickness fingerboard back on, um, which is a job that we do frequently on a Kelkroiden. Um, he, uh, heat presses don't usually work very well on this kind of neck because the fret slots um, go uh, almost as deep as the fingerboard, um, so a heat press doesn't really have the effect that it needs to have. Um, and compression fretting uh, can only go so far as usually not enough to get this guitar to back bow the way we want. Anyways, not about Kelkroydens today, it's about L2s. And uh, here we are with, an R with our L2 with its full thickness fingerboard, full thickness neck, truss rod, three pounds. The thing about this guitar that's really crazy um, is how lightly built the inside is. This is one of those guitars that has one of those 40 thousandths of an inch bridge plates that I showed on the bridge plate video. 40 thousandths, I, don't, I should have grabbed it for this vid, but I don't have it. It's about the thickness of this ruler. Uh, actually, it's probably a little thinner than this ruler. Um, and uh, the bridge plate's that light, but also the entire guitar is that light. The top is super thin on this guitar, measuring about 85, 80 to 85 thousandths of an inch thick. The back, incidentally, is thicker, but not terribly thicker. It's about 95. Um, but the braces on this guitar are crazy thin, too. And I went and I made... Well, I'll show you a couple of things. So this is this is a brace right here. This is the lower face brace from an L2. This is a guitar that I had to completely rebrace um, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was an L2 that had been just trashed by, just trashed badly. It was it was a problem, and it needed an entirely new set of top braces. This is one of the only braces that was salvageable from that guitar, and that's what it looked like. It was a later one. Um, I forget what fa factory order number was on that guitar. I think it was from 1931 though. But that's the brace that's on it. And this is similar to the braces that you find on the black and white tuxedo L00s. It's very similar to that. Um, and uh, this is the lower face brace, meaning the lower tone bar. It's the one that's, well, sorry, it goes this way. It's the one that's down here. Um, anyways, the brace on this guitar, I obviously couldn't take the brace out to show you, so I went and I made one. This is measured off of this guitar, exactly. And, and this is the same, the same brace. So if we compare these, if I hold them next to each other, you can see the difference in size between the brace inside this L00, or L2, and, and a later one. It's very, very different. Um, let me hold them up this way. So you can see how different they are in size. Significant differences in size uh, and significant differences in thickness as well. Um, let me grab a caliper here. This is uh, measuring 150 thousandths of an inch at its widest. 165 at its widest, I was on the wrong side. Uh, whereas this guy at its widest is 210 thousandths of an inch. In terms of thickness, we have uh, just over half an inch, 527 thousandths to be precise in that one exact spot. And this guy is crazy, 370 thousandths tall. So it's 60% the size, like it's, it's a way smaller brace. Um, when you take a piece of wood this, this thin, there's a lot more flexibility in it. Um, there's a lot more give this way than there is on a brace that's this tall. Just imagine on an I-beam that is shorter, which is what a brace is, it's kind of like an I-beam. So there's a lot more movement in this brace. Um, they're not near as strong and they don't support the top near as well. Um, building a guitar that sounds good is all about supporting the top as well as it needs to be, but not too much. And guitars that don't sound as good are overbuilt guitars. Uh, guitars that are built um, to withstand time more than to sound good generally have much bigger braces in them. And guitars that are built to sound amazing but not withstand time can have little popsicle sticks like this in them and just expect them to maybe develop some problems over time. Finding that perfect balance between a lot of strength and uh, the ability to last a long time, <clears throat> that's the magic secret. And, uh, and it's a hard one to achieve, to be honest with you. Anyways, the braces in this L2 uh, are comparable in size, really, to the braces that you'd find in an 18, late 1800s Martin guitar. 
um, they're super, super light. Um, the nice thing about it is that the spruce that they were using is very stiff, um, and even Gibson being Gibson and not really paying very much attention to how they cut the wood, even with the grain run out that they often have, they're still pretty strong braces. In the case of this guitar, everything is so light in it, it's the lightest one I've ever seen, um, that the top has developed a, a fair amount of this sort of deflection. You can see in the light how it goes So the, the bridge has this, this sort of thing going on. It's bulgy a bit behind the bridge. It's diving in front of the bridge and the sound hole is kind of cavey. And uh, when I first saw this guitar, I was admittedly worried about it. Um, but that was five months ago and the guitar hasn't moved since, which is great. The other thing that's shocking about this guitar is that none of the braces inside, none of these teeny tiny braces have ever been loose, have ever cracked, or have ever been re-glued. That's unheard of with a Gibson from this era. It's the strangest thing to see. You'll see it in a guitar that has a perfect top arch, um, those guitars that, that have survived without brace problems. But to see a guitar with top deflection and no braces loose is a strange thing. And when you look inside this guitar, um, with a mirror, I can't show you that unfortunately, but what, what you notice is that if you were able to get in there with a straight edge inside the guitar, you'll notice that these braces have slowly themselves bent with the top. So this brace, instead of being flat, will have the same shape as the top through it. It's just bent and not come unglued. That's how lightly built this thing is. And um, sure, structurally, it's not a great thing to have, uh, but Really, the guitar has lasted nearly 100 years at this point without a crack, without falling apart, so chances are good if you take care of it, it's gonna last uh, a lot longer. Um, the result is the kind of tone that only these super light guitars have. Um, they're really dark, they have this sort of underlying sub-bass frequency across every note. Like even on the treble strings, you have to work really hard at your tone on these things to get to get them to have their fattest sort of sound. But even on the treble strings, with these crazy light strings that are on here, you have this underlying bass roundness. Um, and there's a there's a bit of a cavernous overtone um, and that sort of built-in reverb and a whole lot of sort of spooky smokiness to it. Um, so a lot of finger style ragtime players dig these things. I wish I could do that upside down for you, but I can't. They're fun for that. They're also really good with a, with a really heavy flat pick. Not strumming. You can't strum on these things and make it sound terribly good. But just, it's just single notes. Um, and just letting them ring is a, it's an amazing thing. The attack and sustain are very different on a guitar that's this light than on a more heavily built guitar that's sustained for much longer. These guitars have a lot of attack and then the sustain, it, de it decays pretty quick. Um, whereas a more heavily built guitar uh, will have lots of sustain but less of that smokiness and less of that sub bass support that makes these guitars, in my mind, beguiling to listen to. So the strings that are used on this, uh, on this one, this is what I've got on this guitar right here. The, the Daddario, 11 to 45, what they call their Gypsy Jazz strings. Um, the original strings that Daddario Sr. developed uh, for Mario McAvery back in the day. Um, they are a, a high carbon steel core with a silver plated copper wrap on them and they're gauged 11 to 45. So they're pretty stinking light. It still has an 11 at the top because if you go with a 10 on the top they just get wiry and thin. So an 11 and, or even a 12 on the top, I wouldn't put a 12 on this but on many of them a 12 um, to 45 is nice. These strings have a nice warmth to them as well and, and a nice little punch. As, um, and so that's why I like them on this guitar. I wouldn't run 12s on this guitar, it's, it's far too lightly built. Other strings that I frequently use on these kind of guitars, um, this is a go-to for me, is the John Pierce Foster Bronze Slightly Lights. Um, that's set number 160 SL. These, I don't know why they call them slightly light. It's a bit of a misnomer. They're gauged 11 to 50. You can see the gauges on them right here. Uh, upside down, backwards gauging. Um, 11 to 50, and so what I'll do for a lot of these early 12 fret Gibsons that are very light, I'll run these strings, but then I'll swap out the high E and the B, and I'll put a 12 and a 16 instead of the 11 and the 15, just to give a bit more beef up, to, up at the top, um, which works really nice. It's really great to keep low tension bases on these guitars to really bring out that warmth. 
um, but keep the trebles with a bit of tension to add the power and thickness that you like. Obviously on one this light, I'm gonna stay super light with these 11, the 45s. Um, and I prefer these, these uh, uh, the Gypsy Jazz strings over Foster Bronze because they're a darker string and, and this guitar really wants to be dark. Um, what else can I tell you about the L2? It's a, it's a, I think that's pretty much it. I think I've pretty much covered the whole thing, but if you get a chance to try one out and do so, they're really exceptional. As compared to a Kelcroydon, just so you know, because the Kelcroydon is, is very much the same guitar as an L2, just a dressed down version of it. Um, the Kelcroydon uh, has uh, less power in the fundamental because it has less mass in the neck. Mass in the neck is gonna clean things up. It's gonna remove a bit of overtone. It's gonna add power and projection and, uh, and really just give more of that dry fundamental sort of sound. So the Kelcroydons have more of the spookiness, more of the overtones. Um, and uh, that sort of shotgun scattery kind of tone that's really dark and subtle and, and stormy and, uh, and less powerful. The warmer and darker a guitar gets, the less powerful it is. Um, finding one that has everything is really the trick. Um, obviously, this guitar is not playable right now. It's just, it's waiting for a neck reset, etc. But, uh, but it's an interesting thing to compare. Um, the L1s are strangely not built as lightly as an L2, and maybe that was an intentional thing by Gibson. Um, but L2s tend to be the most lightly built guitars of, of the lot. Uh, and, um, yeah, and then the other thing about L2 bracing, is they're not all like this. I've said this before, but many are like this. And Kelcroydon's the same deal. Many are like this, and some are like this. And even in that period, in that 9500 to 9700 factory order number range, you'll see both kinds. And I don't know why. I don't know if Gibson spec these or if the person that was, there was one person building like this and one person building like this, or maybe a half a dozen people building like this and four building like, I don't know, I wasn't there. And we don't have records. All we can do is speculate. But, uh, but they're not all equal and it's a very important thing uh, if you're shopping around for one of these things to know what you're getting and to look inside the guitar. You can see through the sound hole how teeny tiny the back braces are if you take a good look at them. And, um, and, uh, and they're all real different. Not one is better than the other. Some people really like this and some people really like this. Myself, I need this guitar because my attack is too heavy. Um, for a lot of other people with a lighter attack, this guitar is the magic. Generally speaking, people, these are the ones that people want. Um, but I like the later heavier built guitars to handle, well, I'm left-handed, but my left hand attack. Um, and, uh, and knowing which is the one for you is really half the battle when you're shopping around for an old guitar. Anyways, there you go. That's the L2. One last look at the, at the Gold Sparkle L2. This one is on our website if you want to have, take uh, a look at closer, closer up pictures of it. We have pictures of it there on our website now. Anyways, thanks very much for listening and, uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.